thank you everyone for staying to the end of the day. And also I would like to echo everyone else's hearty thanks to Laura, to Elio and to Thomas for organizing this wonderful workshop, a chance to come to Stuttgart and also to meet so many old friends and to make some new ones and to learn some interesting topics. So thank you ever so much. All right, so motivated by polar, by pump probe experiments, some of which were done in Hamburg nearby, uh, our Murray gang at Rutgers, that's Zekun, Ahana, Pavel, Piers, and myself, decided to study driven phonon system. Now in these pump probe experiments, one can think of basically the pump probe as effectively modifying a, an effective potential. And it modifies this effective potential such that it can give us non-thermal stable states. And also it can give us uh, order parameter fluctuations, which again, we would not get in equilibrium. So what were our motivating questions? The first was, of course, to reproduce what had been seen already. And then we wanted to ask with a minimalist model whether we could get light-induced classical phenomena inaccessible in equilibrium, okay? And that was a way of tuning up our, our of um, honing our skills in this problem because this was new for many of us. But then the real question we wanted was, can we come up with signatures of light-induced quantum effects in a real material? Okay. All right. So the setting for the experiments is strontium titanate. Today, we've learned about a number of strontium systems, and we learned about uh, strontium titanate hetero uh, super lattices a little bit earlier. Uh, let me just remind you a little bit about strontium titanate. Strontium titanate is a rebellious material. It's isovalent and isostructural to its close cousin barium titanate, which is a work which is a workhorse of perovskite fer fer ferroelectrics. In fact, at Bell Labs, it was a close contender for memory that was eventually beaten out by magnetic memory. Okay, but unlike its uh, more docile cousin, strontium titanate refuses to go ferroelectric, okay? Unless it's pushed, as we'll tell you. So these are some original data by Muller and Burkhardt from some time ago, and the dielectric constant goes up, 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 and then it just saturates, okay? And it just never, it goes up, it's quite large, but it doesn't want to diverge, okay? However, it can, for electricity, it's very close to a classical phase transition, it can be induced by uniaxial strain, by calcium, and in particular by oxygen 18 substitution. And in particular, there's this transverse optical mode associated with the titanium, and that needs a little bit of a nudge. It needs encouragement. Okay, now we have a critical phonon, and sorry, what's going on? We have a critical phonon, and it's a transverse optical phonon. And in fact, the dielectric constant can be thought of as, this is a optical phonon cutoff, a sort of Debye optical phonon squared divided by a soft phonon. And so strontium titanate is known to fit this soft phonon theory um, over a broad temperature scale, okay? And in particular, in recent times, the Cambridge group has shown that with a very, a very delicate balance of oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, one can even drive strontium titanate, which is normally here. This is temperature versus tuning parameter, which is pressure. It can be real pressure or chemical pressure. One can actually tune it. Normally it sits here, but one can actually tune it to a quantum critical point. And that's confirmed by looking at the dielectric susceptibility, which doesn't go as one over T the way it would at a Curie point, Instead, it goes as one over T squared, as predicted some years ago for ferroelectrics uh, at a quantum critical point. So this is our host, strontium titanate. And 
the key point here is that strontium titanate is almost a ferroelectric, okay? All right. Now, it's strontium titanate is paraelectric at all temperatures. However, what has been found recently is if you have a terahertz pulse, you can actually force, and we'll talk a little bit more about the detail, coherent motion, and you can get for electricity. Okay? And this was done in 2019 uh, by two groups, one at MIT, one at Hamburg. And they found that then you could get for electricity as a function of fluence, that's field intensity, or as a function of time. Now, driven classical transitions have been studied in a number of systems. But what we are ultimately interested in is driven quantum criticality. Now, theoretically, this has been studied. However, it's been realized mostly in closed systems like cold atoms. In particular, these are systems where you can prepare initial states and the signatures can be something like a Lachmann echo, right? However, of course, quantum materials like strontium titanate are open systems with 10 to the 23 or so atoms. And there is no way that we can access these constituents microscopically. And so the question is, if we could get dynamic, uh, if we could drive quantum criticality, what would be its signature? So that was one of the motivations. So let's actually talk about the experiments. Don't know why this isn't. Okay, let's talk about the experiments. The first experiment was a direct excitation of the polar phonon. It was uh, excited directly and it induced a transient polar phase, okay? This is the optical phonon. These are other phonons to show that it's only the, op the, the polar phonon that was actually driven. And uh, there's been a lot of work on time-dependent density functional theory, particularly from Angel Rubio's group on modeling this system. Now, another set of experiments is with indirect excitation. Here, the idea is that you drive a high-frequency optical phonon okay, that is anharmonically coupled to the polar phonon. And what's seen then is that you get a polar phase that's metastable on rather long timescales. Now, this system has been looked at by Alaska Subedi and his collaborators, who include Antoine Georges. And this is a system that we thought we would look at uh, in our little adventures. Now, you might ask, how do you see ferroelectricity out of equilibrium? Okay. The way you see it is if you have an electric field at, that is at frequency omega, you look at the nonlinear response, okay? It'll induce dipoles at frequency two omega. Those dipoles will act as sources for a uh, simple harmonic generation. And in fact, the absolute value squared of this will come up as the intensity. So it's with second harmonic generation that you can access uh, these polar phases. In particular, this tensor here, chi i, j, k, will be zero if you have centrist symmetry, but will not if you break, okay? So that's the way it's looked. Okay, so the key idea here, before I start telling you about the technical details, let me just give you an impression of what we're going to do, then we'll do it. So the key idea here is that with optical tweezers. Optical tweezers can be thought of as a sort of, um, excuse me, uh, light-induced phase transitions can be thought of as a many-body generalization of optical tweezers. Well, what do I mean by that? 
Well, in optical tweezers, we, with a laser, we, take, we, uh, we um, polarize an atom such that its energy is reduced by the field intensity. And so we change its effective potential to look like this. Similarly, with a light-induced phase transition, the field uh, changes, modifies the effective potential associated with the soft phonon. We get a change to the mass that is proportional to E squared, the field intensity. And here, omega p is the soft polar mode. And uh, he, this, this is alpha is the quartic term. And what we find is when this term, which I'll call omega p squared e, becomes less than zero, then of course we get polar ordering. And this polar ordering will be proportional to the electric field. Okay. So that's the sort of approach that we're taking. I don't understand why this is up here. Okay, let's do it this way. Okay, this is the approach we're taking. And in our case, the um, electric field is actually a function of time. Again, we are driving a high frequency optical phonon. Okay, that's going to lead to this term as we'll see. And we can get the phase transition as a function of fluence, as field intensity. So let's think, look, think a little bit about the evolution of uh, the effective potential as a function of field amplitude. Let's just consider the quadratic term here as a mass, okay? Now, because we know that we're going to have a mass as a function of time, now that mass is going to have several terms. The first term is just the bare soft phonon squared. Then the second term here, the classical correction is going to be minus chi times e squared. And as we'll see, that chi will depend on this resonant driving of the high frequency mode and the enharmonic coupling between the high frequency mode Q and the soft polar phonon P. And now the question is, what about the quantum corrections? What do we do there? Well, we expect that quantum fluctuations will disorder the system. So they'll act. So we expect that this mass term will have a different sign than that mass term. So in other words, we expect that the quantum corrections will change the critical fluence. And in fact, will require that we go to higher uh, fluences to get to go into the uh, polar phase. Now, one of the challenges, so what we expect is that here, we go from the paraelectric and we go into the light induced paraelectric phase, but we expect that this term will play a little bit with what the uh, critical uh, fluence is, or in, here, in this case, the critical field. Now, the challenge of determining this mass is that we have to actually treat non-equilibrium quantum fluctuations at the same time as existing with classical counterparts. Because Andreas, who's done these experiments in Hamburg, tells us that they really can't do these experiments below two Kelvin. So that tells us that we really have to worry about classical non-equilibrium fluctuations coexisting with quantum non-equilibrium fluctuations. So that's our challenge. OK, so let's begin. Let's start with a minimalist model. Okay, let's start simply. We're going to start with a minimalist model, namely two enharmonically coupled oscillators. Okay, and this is, and we're going to write down an action which was first actually written by Alaska Subiedi. Uh, in particular, he was studying lead tightening. All right, so first of all, we're going to be interested in a system that's very close to its transition, very close to criticality. So when we consider the Q phonon, which is our high frequency phonon that's being driven, we don't have to consider, we can only we don't have to consider a higher order term. We can get away with just considering a quadratic term because we are going to worry about weak driving. Okay. So this is our high frequency phonon. 
This is our polar phonon. And of course, omega Q is the frequency associated with the, with, uh, the high frequency one. This is, this is our soft phonon. This is our quartic term, okay? Uh, ZQ and ZP are effective charges associated with the two modes. And now we have a PQ interaction that's even, even. So P squared, Q squared. You might say, why don't I consider linear, linear or linear cubic? Okay, all that I care about is that they sum up to an even value. You can actually show that uh, such terms just lead to a renormalization of our coupling to our field. So this is the first term that actually leads to new, new physics, okay? And it's an anharmonic coupling. And what Alaska did was he actually uh, wrote this down and determined what gamma should be specifically for using density functional theory, specifically for lead tightening. Okay, so that's our action. These are our classical equations of motion, okay? And you notice right away that here we have a change in the mass that goes as gamma Q squared. Okay. So, and of course we have E of T, which is harmonic and we have a time dependent effective potential. When even with this minimalist coupled equations, this is going to be a little bit tough for us. So let's make some approximations. Okay, so let's be upfront about what approximations we make. These are our classical equations of motion. Now, the first thing we can assume is we can assume, oops, or, sorry. The first thing we can assume is the fact that uh, our drive frequency, which is resonant to our uh, Q mode, is very high compared to this. If that's the case, we can say this is very small. We're going to throw out the dissipation terms. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that this term is very small compared to that. We're gonna time average this term. Remember, it's fluctuating around zero because we're in the parelectric phase. When we time average, we just time average over a time that's much, much greater than one over this frequency, okay? So we're gonna assume that this is much, much smaller than that. So in other words, we're neglecting the back action of P on a rapidly oscillating cube. So then what do we get? Well, we get a simple equation for Q. Q is just going to be some susceptibility, E0 cosine big omega T, where the susceptibility has this form. And of course, since we remember that cosine of theta squared, cosine squared, ugh, cosine squared of theta is half uh, times one plus cosine two of theta, what we can do is divide this, when we square this here, we can divide it into two parts. The constant part will be our time average part. And then we'll have another term, which goes like cotine two omega, big omega T. So this is the equation of motion for our soft mode P, given these assumptions. So we have a P double dot term, we have a time independent term here, but it is proportional to E squared, if you notice. And we have a cubic term, and then we have a driven term. Okay. Now we're gonna make our life even simpler. We're gonna throw out the rapidly oscillating term, at least for the moment. This is our effective potential. Let's first work with that. So we work with this. And what do we find? We find, of course, that when this term is zero, then we get a phase transition. And you can look at this phase transition as a function of the ZP, and you see that you have a polarization. So what we found now is we found that we actually have, in this effective potential idea, we actually have this phase diagram. Good. All right, well, this is a little bit of a, abstract system. So let's actually go to a cubic material, a 3D cubic material. So an example could be potassium tantalate, but also strontium titanate because it's only, it's a weakly disordered tetragonal system, okay? So the key thing is when we go to a cubic system, well, then we have to have a symmetry allowed and harmonic coupling. 
But the key thing is in a cubic system, we can have an anisotropic shift in the soft phonon frequency. Okay, so we can have, we have soft phonon frequencies in the X and XX, YY and ZZ. And in particular, that tells us right away that the light polarization, which is something that hadn't been played with before, can control our polar orderings. So then the question is, is there anything new? So what we find, and I'll just give you a, a sample, is that we can get two-stage symmetry breaking transition. So in particular, if we have circularly polarized light, we can go from the original parelectric phase to an intermediate phase. This is 001 with a two-fold degeneracy. And then we eventually go to an AAC with an eight-fold degeneracy. And I remind you that in equilibrium, we just go directly to, oh, we have one stage transition. So we're able to get polar structures that we can't get in equilibrium and we can get two, state, two stage. Okay, now let's push ahead because we still want to get to quantum. So let's push ahead, but this we're just honing our tools. Let's go beyond the effective potential approach. If we go beyond the effective potential approach, the two things we're going to add are we're going to add dissipation and we're going to add our rapidly oscillating term. Oops, I'm going too fast, sorry. Okay, so the first thing is that by having this term here, what we're finding is that our we have a, a minimum, but we're going to have fluctuations around that minimum, okay? So we're going to have fluctuations around that minimum because of these two terms, okay? And so if those fluctuations are of order, the scale of the minimum itself, of course, we're gonna have, we're gonna go back and forth between the two minimum. And so what we find is that we have a second critical uh, field, and that's where we get rapidly going back and forth. And as we'll see in a minute, we actually get chaos and period doubling for a given set of parameters, okay? And looking at this equation, it's not super surprising because it turns out that people in dynamical systems know this equation, particularly without this term, because this is just a generalized duffing oscillator, okay? And this term makes it generalized. Without this term, it's a duffing oscillator. This is a system, a simple system with minimum nonlinearity and dissipation that's been shown to have chaotic behavior. Okay, so the mathematicians know a lot about this, this equation. Um, we sort of backed into it, but then when we saw chaotic behavior, we said, let's see if this makes any sense. So what, just to give you a sort of sampling of what we found uh, here, if one looks at, this is E versus P at very low fluences here, we're of course in the parelectric phase, then we have two possible solutions. This is starting off with random initial conditions. We get two possible solutions. We ramp up the field. And once we get here, you notice that we, here we have a stable uh, polar solution right here. But here we have something interesting. We have, this is oscillating at the driving frequency, but here we're oscillating at a fraction of the driving frequency and we're oscillating about zero, okay? So this is well known towards an onset of chaos. And once we go even further, then if we look at P dot versus P, uh, which is what's called a Poincaré section, what we find is we have this kind of behavior, which is signatory of chaos, but for, Every now and then we get a stable solution. And this is what's known in the dynamical community as Kolmogorov moser arnold structure. So what we're seeing, and remember that this is in a, in a quantum material, is that we can actually get light-induced classical phenomena that is chaotic, okay? So we can get chaos. So when we talked to Andreas, he said that in retrospect, he may have some data which already shows this. They weren't so they didn't quite know what was going on at high fluences. So we're excited about that. And we'll be talking more about this. So this is a phenomena, a light-induced classical phenomena that's inaccessible in equilibrium. 
And also we find that we have persistent polarization. Um, our experiments, our, our uh, numerical experiments and our calculations were of course done for our harmonic field, but we can ask what happens when we turn our field off. And what we find is that we have a persistent polarization basically because the P gradually relaxes to equilibrium due to the damped motion of the high frequency mode, okay? So this is qualitatively similar to the observed behavior, even though the kinds of times reported are much greater than are accessible in our calculation. Okay, so now the question is, what about quantum? Because that's what we were really after. The reason we're studying classical is to sort of get ourselves going, okay? And make, making sure that we could rederive what had been done before in other ways, okay? And maybe push a little bit ahead. So now what happens when we have quantum effects? Well, again, the challenge is the fact that we have coexistence of non-equilibrium classical and quantum fluctuations. I should say that there was earlier work uh, by Peter Orth, who's here, and collaborators, and also Aditi Mitra, on quenches directly to the quantum critical point. And we studied those carefully, but we have to look at situations where we have classical and quantum together, okay? And so the question is, how do we go about doing it? Well, let's go back to our minimalist model. Here's our Lagrangian. And the approach we take, and I'll just be giving a little flavor for this, of course, because I'm going to run out of time, is we want to quantize this and then take a schwinger keldish approach, okay? Yes, okay, thank you. So we'll take a schwinger keldish approach and the Keldish generating function can be written as a path integral where our action has contributions both from, from both out, outward going and inward coming contours. And we can write a classical quantum basis where we define our classical P and our quantum P in this way, where P plus and P minus correspond to the upper and the lower contours, okay? And when we take into account the connectivity between the, out, the forward and the backward paths, what we find is that we have two types of Green's functions. One, the retarded and advanced uh, response, and of course the Keldish Green function, which is telling us about the temporal correlations and the occupancy. Now, we cannot use the conventional saddle point approach in this problem. Uh, why? Because conventionally, what would you do? You'd remove the quantum sources, but in this case, when we remove the quantum sources, the partition function is just one, and so we can't do it. However, we know that the Keldish path integral is invariant to reparameterization of the fluctuation fields. And in particular, if we require that it's stationary with respect to variation of P on the upper and the lower contour, what we get is this equation, which is an equation of motion, it looks like, and we can define with P on the upper or the lower contour, and this defines the classical trajectory. And now what we can do is we can average over the plus and the minus contours, okay? And we get uh, this expression. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not very good with this. We get this expression. And the classical approximation is, of course, just to take this term and to approximate by the average cubed, which would look like this diagrammatically. Okay. And in fact, diagrammatically, if we resum these tree diagrams, we actually get the classical equation of motion. So now the question is, what is the leading order quantum correction? Well, of course it means putting in a loop, but let's just see how that works. Let's go back to our expression where we've averaged over the plus and the minus contours. If we're interested in looking at the leading order quantum corrections, what we can do is look at a quadratic expansion around the classical trajectory. We write down the action, where here the delta P is 
the difference between P and the classical trajectory. And what we find then is that this P cubed term here, oh, I'm sorry, this is not, this is not behaving. This P cubed term can be written in this way. So you have a, uh, the classical P cubed plus this. This is a little too enthusiastic to finish. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, so, and so what we find then is that this self energy, I'm afraid to point to this, this self energy is related to the Keldish Green's function. And so what we see is it's just a loop of that sort. So this is a hard tree connect correction. So we have Gaussian fluctuations. Even though we have Gaussian fluctuations, the fact that our equation of motion is nonlinear in this coupling alpha tells us we're going to get a shift in our critical fluence. And in fact, that's what happens. So let's, let's actually look at a semi-physical example. What are the physical consequences of this? Let's take a phonon with a dispersion. So we take a phonon with a dispersion. So we have omega p plus a dispersion here. And we have our classical correction. This is really getting annoying. Our classical correction and our quantum correction. And what we can do is assume that our classical correction is going to be something like this, where we just have a linear ramping down of our classical mass. And we can ask, how is that changed? Okay, so here we're looking at the transition as a function of time, not as a function of fluence. We can do it one way or the other. We can say, how does it change? And what we find, to make a long story short without dragging you through the calculations, is that if you have a fast quench, so this TQ here is what would happen when you have quantum corrections. This is what happens if you just are classical. And as expected, if you have a quench, a very fast quench, your system, the system doesn't have a chance to respond. But if you have a very slow uh, change in the mass, then the system, the quantum fluctuations will have a chance to act. And in fact, they will slow the system down, okay? So what we expect then is that the critical fluence will be dependent on the driving rate. And irregardless of this particular simple rendition, the key point is if quantum corrections are there, the critical fluence should be dependent on the driving rate. That can be checked. And in fact, that should be seen as the temperatures are lower, okay? So at higher temperatures, the fluence, the critical fluences should be reasonably independent of the driving rate. But as we lower the temperature, they become more and more dependent on the driving rate. And that should be due to quantum corrections. So this is a first signature of light induced quantum effects. And we're in discussion with the experimentalists to see what else can be actually calculated they can measure. Polarization, polarization correlations we can look at. I think they can measure that. There's some discussion about noise, but right now the next step is to talk to the experimentalists and see what can actually be measured. Okay. So summary and outlook. We're looking at a driven phonon system that's motivated by experiment, experiments on the quantum paraelectric strontium titanate. In that system, a high frequency, oops, a high frequency optical phonon is driven because of its anharmonic coupling to the polar mode. We get a, a, a polar phase. It's been investigated experimentally classically. And the question, we've done an analysis of a minimalist model, both using an effective potential and looking beyond that. And what we find in summary is that as a function of fluence, we go from paraelectric to light-induced ferroelectric, 
this of course was seen experimentally where we've gone beyond the that is that we have also found that as one increases the fluence one for particular parameter range, we can get period doubling and chaotic behavior that's reminiscent of the dusting, duffing oscillator. And if we include quantum effects, we get fluctuations to the point that uh, we have reentrant into a parelectric phase where we have the possibility for this rich dynamical behavior. Um, again, for classical non-thermal phenomena, we have light controlled uh, polarization controlled or orderings that have not been seen in, in equilibrium, strong driving, we get period doubling and chaotic behavior. And the quantum effects are that the critical fluence depends on the driving rate. And we're looking forward to discussing with experiment what more we can do to make predictions about interesting behavior in these systems. So uh, our work is summarized here. And I thank you very much. <laughs>